It's a pleasure to be here and with such a, a wonderful panel. Um, you'd think with a job title like mine, I might know something vaguely about this topic, but um, I wouldn't want to over-egg it. Uh, instead, I'm going to be drawing on the expertise of our uh, decision maker panel. Um, I'm going to invite them to just briefly introduce themselves. I've given them a strict limit of five minutes each um, to say what they do, uh, how they engage with the question at hand, um, but also to identify one key challenge in their world for um, translating environmental research into policy uh, and creating pathways to real world impact. Uh, and then I will open the conversation up to the floor. I know that you've had a, a full morning um, on this topic, so I'm sure you'll be raring to go. Um, and then I hope that we can make the bulk of the session um, as interactive as possible. Uh, so let, I'm just going to start left, moving right, uh, in no particular order. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Kieran. And I will invite uh, our panellists, uh, who I'm delighted can join us today, um, to do their five minutes worth. OK, thank you, Sarah. Um, <clears throat> hello, everyone. Uh, I understand you've had quite a busy couple of days and going through the rest of the week answering this question for us, which would be great. Um, this is one of the difficult questions, I think. So I'll just go back a step and let you know who I am and what I do. So I'm Kieran. I'm the head of science monitoring and evaluation, which is a bit of a mouthful, for the Environmental Land Management Schemes, the UK Government uh, Department of the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs has various devolved responsibilities. So I cover England, pretty much, and various bits of stuff that cover the international side as well. Um, but the environmental land management schemes are part of our agricultural transition away from European uh, Union policies in agriculture towards uh, you know, our version of what's required to have the sort of environmental outcomes that we want from our agricultural policy, uh, as well as the food goals and all the sort of societal benefits and goods that come with that, whether it's uh, restoring our countryside or um, eating well, healthily, etc. Um, all of that framed, of course, within a, a sense of justice, participation, and so on. Um, what do I do? I manage lots of really bright people who are scientists, economists, social scientists, statisticians, operational researchers. I work very closely with policy colleagues, and we provide the evidence for ministers, of which we have four in the department plus a secretary of state to make decisions. They make a decision on which direction they want to go in and we prep up some options to, to achieve that, right? That's how it works in simplest terms. Now a whole load of people try and pile in on that, um, including uh, the academics, the NGOs, business, uh, the citizenry, anyone with an interest uh, with a pen or an email by and large. And that's a good thing, right? That's how we want it. So you have this sort of multi-level governance of people who are doing, people who are thinking, people who are writing, people researching. And then we get stuck trying to work out how to deduce and reduce all of that into three sort of pithy uh, little ways to go and that's very very complicated but the main reason why it's massively complicated is you never start from a blank page there's always a huge legacy with policy it's very complicated it's all overlapping there are lots of competing outcomes that are desired lots of competing different ways of delivering something and some people obviously argue uh, and jostle for their piece of the pie and you know, the fortitude of their ideas, their research, etc. Now you're talking about the environment. So the environment is hugely contested in terms of all of the knowledges that surround it, hugely contested in terms of winners, losers, uh, participants, scale, uh, everything. It's completely polymorphous. It's a very, very difficult policy area. And then the timescales are not helpful uh, in terms of the small p politics of the day to day, the media attention, uh, etc. So to answer the question about how to do this better or well or what have you, I think it all boils down to problem formulation, 
So people like me need to spend more time in places like this, listening to people like you, uh, as well as other panelists. Um, NGOs play a huge part in what we do, so does industry, so does citizenry, and so on, and we certainly don't have all of the ideas. Research councils are hugely important as well in enabling us to try and stick to a slightly bigger picture, longer term picture. And as I say, in the environment, that's hugely contested. So uh, I remember in the 90s sort of having difficult conversations with my mum and dad about climate change. And I still have very difficult conversations with my mum and dad about climate change. And they've evolved a little bit, but not a great deal. Um, one of the huge benefits of my job is seeing stuff uh, actually take root, take shape, uh, have huge amounts of participation and so on. So I do the assessment, for example, for our landscape recovery schemes. These are uh, projects somewhere between 500 hectares and 5,000 on a contiguous site uh, in England, restoring species, rivers, all sorts of really nice stuff and having lots of local participation and ownership of the outcomes and so on. So the great joy of the job is doing things like that, then going to visit these places and having a great time talking to the people who are actually doing the work. But all that boils down to me is good problem formulation. What is it we're trying to do? What evidence do we need? What research do we have? What research do we not have? What research do we need to, to, to produce? And how do we present that in such a way that has efficacy? And, you know, I, I'll be blunt with you, it's really hard. Really, really hard. So thank you for being the next generation to take on this wicked problem. Excellent. Thank you for that encouragement. Problem formulation. OK, Prue, your turn. Hi, everyone. So I'm Prue Addison. I'm the Conservation Strategy Director at the Local Wildlife Trust, the Berkshire Buckinghamshire and Oxfordshire Wildlife Trust. I'm also a trustee of the National Wildlife Trust as a collective um, across the UK. So um, a little bit about me. Before the Wildlife Trust, I actually worked at Oxford University as a Knowledge Exchange Fellow um, in Conservation Science, translating that to be relevant to big businesses, so helping them understand biodiversity. So I've, I've worked on both sides of the divide, shall we say. Um, I've worked in government agencies, academia, consultancy, and now NGOs. So I've got a bit of experience of you know, taking this from different angles. But specifically from the Wildlife Trust perspective, we're a, we're a local slash regional environmental NGO. We operate over three counties. We've got about 150 staff. We manage 86 nature reserves. We're a membership organisation. We have about 28,000 members that support us in what we do. So that membership, um, the, the money that comes in from our membership, if you're not members, I encourage you all to become members of your local wildlife trust. But that's really important in, in setting our direction. So we are quite a standard conservation organisation. We have very strong charitable objectives, which are all around the conservation of nature, both in terms of its protection and restoration. And very much, you know, we're very much in line with um, 30 by 30, nature's recovery, all the kind of the direction of travel of, of both national government and internationally through the Convention of Biological Diversity. Um, we're also very much, we've got a people element too, so all about connecting people with nature. So we do a lot of things. Um, we, we're very busy. Um, I would say that we, you know we kind of are on quite different to Kieran. We're on the front line of actually delivering um, work on the ground, so conservation. So a lot of the, the policies that are set, you know, we start to change our direction. The, the grants that, that come up and become available, we start to shape what we're doing to make sure that we can fit to actually apply for that type of funding. So um, one key challenge very much that relates to, to Kieran's point, um, I think, is the creation of usable science for practice. So this, this means both being able to form, formulate that problem statement, but also for scientists to actually you know, let go of some of their scientific ambition sometimes, to just understand what, you know, for practitioners' perspectives, 
What are the questions that need answering? And some, what I have found is these are sometimes not as advanced as, you know, as pure research. Uh, so these are sometimes quite simple questions. There's just big knowledge gaps that we have, um, you know, about the ecology of a species or just testing out a new technology to help us monitor the environment in a more efficient way. Um, so sometimes, it, I think it takes a certain type of scientist to be interested in that type of work, that type of research. It's not for everyone. I think it's fair to say. So that's something for all of you to consider is, do you want to do that type of work, that type of research that does have real world impact, but maybe is not as advanced and you know, imaginative and creative as, oh, you know, where you see the field in 20 years time. <laughs> so it's usable research that really needs you know, immediate, um, you know, we need immediate answers. So some of the things that we're, um, we are involved in at the moment is um, biodiversity net gain research. So the first Agile project is all about biodiversity net gain and how that is going to play out locally um, in, in our region and, and nationally. And I'm involved in that project as a wildlife trust because I really need to know answers about some of these questions that the researchers are answering. So what are the social aspects of biodiversity net gain and how does that play out for local communities where um, developers are losing habitats and where habitats will be gained in the environment? Um, also, how does the, the biodiversity net gain, the DEFRA metric, how does that actually work in practice and how could we improve that if we look at monitoring beyond just habitats but also species like invertebrates? So these are things that this research group have been testing, which is all really super important. Julia has also been involved in that. So also just two other examples of things that we're involved in is artificial intelligence for um, habitat and plant monitoring. That'll be super important for us in terms of thinking about the efficiency of monitoring and understanding the state of our environment in a more real, real time way rather than once every few five or 10 years time where we can manage to actually get our staff around to survey, survey habitats. And the final one is a really important one. It's all about carbon and climate. So really understanding the carbon storage and flux um, of, our, of our different habitats in the UK. So we're supporting some researchers being able to monitor carbon on some of our nature reserves. And that will be incredibly useful for us to be able to maybe switch the, you know, reframe the way that we talk about the work that we do. It's still conservation, but instead of just being about biodiversity, we would like to be able to share the benefits for, for carbon and for, for other natural capital assets. So that's the type of research that, that we're particularly interested in, the research that's useful for us. Well said. Thank you very much. Charlotte. Hello, so um, I'm Charlotte Stead. I head up the Domestic Maritime Emissions Team in um, the Department for Transport. Um, and I would say sort of uh, what, what my team does is specifically policy delivery. Um, at the moment, we are sort of at a pinnacle point in maritime. Um, we had some really great um, international negotiations going on last week, and we've kind of come to uh, what well, the International Maritime Organization has come to uh, this, I guess, the agreement that we need to be at net zero by or around sort of 2050, which is absolutely huge for maritime. It's been been around for a very, very long time. And so it's very difficult to sort of get the industry to, to move. And um, I specifically work on um, domestic maritime. So anything that's kind of in UK waters. And I guess kind of one of the, um, one of the uh, I guess, problems we have at the moment is how does international work with domestic policy? And I think there's a lot of interactions with that. It isn't just maritime, it is um, globally as well. You know, aviation is another one in, in, um, in, in transport. And um, one of the things which we're sort of, I guess, struggling with at the moment is because it's very new to maritime kind of going towards net zero, there's a, there's a, there's a lack of data. And it's like, how do we get that data in order to make these policy decisions? You know, in maritime, things you invest for sort of 50, 60 years, that's sort of how long a vessel lasts. And so in order to give certainty to investment, we need to give assurances to industry. It's like, yes, this is the direction we're going in. This is, this is, we're not going to change our mind. You know, we're not suddenly going to change sort of direction in, in, in policy. And data, evidence, research, all of that 
helps us give that certainty to industry. You know, they're investing a lot of money into this. And kind of there are a few different ways in which we, um, I guess, gain evidence. Um, first is we issue a lot of um, uh, kind of feasibility studies. So, um, you know, we will sort of go out to tender to universities, um, to consultancies and sort of say, hey, look, you know, we've got this question. Can you help us answer this? Um, can you help us sort of gain the data um, on this? Um, a second one is we often issue sort of um, call for evidences. Um, so we sort of have a list of questions and we sort of send it out to the sector or researchers um, to kind of help us kind of get data and sort of research on this. Um, and a lot, a lot of the time, the research is really, really helpful. However, how does it work in sort of the real world? I think that's sort of what sort of, sort of Prue mentioned. And one way in which sort of I'm actually developing at the moment is um, creating, um, I guess, kind of like working groups where you actually have researchers and industry. So my job isn't just to sort of gain, um, um, uh, I guess, uh, research and sort of data and analyze it. It's also about bringing people together as well. So, um, you know, there might be a really great um, sort of research piece, but actually with a bit of industry, um, I guess, direction, that might actually help transform that, that research into something then that we can use. So I guess, um, I guess my job is also partly a, a, a bit of a facilitator of kind of bringing, bringing people together um, as well. And I think, I think that's probably the fundamental um, issue that we have is that we don't have that many groups where you have got lots of people across sort of different sector, different backgrounds um, sort of coming together. And I think with, by doing that, I think that is really going to help, um, I guess, bring, I guess, the sort of science into policy because we're, we're going to be getting um, sort of the data, the research, but actually how that can work practically. And I guess that's um, how you would then, I guess, see your kind of research in action as well. Um, and I mean, you know, I, I come from a research background and then sort of moving in, into policy. And that's what I actually really like. I like seeing, right, this is the impact of what, what I'm doing. Um, so I think, yeah, I think sort of the question of sort of how do you get science sort of into policy, I think it is about bringing those who have that expert knowledge in that research, bringing it to industry and sort of saying, look, this is what we think works, you know, what is your input into this? And it's about doing it collaboratively. Um, and I think that is the way in which policies are going to be kind of no, no regrets by actually bringing everybody together to actually decide what works and what doesn't work. Everybody has a different perspective. Um, and I think it's important to get as many of those perspectives um, as possible. So the key challenge you've identified, I think, but correct me if I've got this wrong, is that kind of data gaps problem? Yeah, I think it's that data gap. How do you generate it where, 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 is, where there's a gap? Exactly. Excellent. Thank you very much. Last but by no means least, Julian. So you just mentioned industry. So that's me. I'm industry. And I work for Mott McDonald. We are an engineering consultancy firm. And my company is involved with the design of major infrastructure projects, roads, railways, hospitals, housing, projects like East West Rail, Port Talbot Development, um, Thames Tideway, and you might have heard of HS2. My company is involved with HS2. My job and the reason why I work with my company is because my job is to mainstream the recovery of nature in everything that we do. And it's the best job ever. It's challenging, but it is the best job ever. I spend my days, one day I'll be speaking to the CEO of Anglian Water and explaining how their problems of regulating water flow and improving water quality can be solved by nature. The next day I'll be training up our brilliant graduates into biodiversity net gain and explaining that success of biodiversity net gain is so much more than the metric. It's about creating wildlife rich habitats. And it's challenging. And one of the solutions that I always go to is research. Absolutely, I've got a background in, in research and work with Prue on, on quite a number of years now. And I think it's, it's really interesting because when you look at major infrastructure projects and this question about how do we get um, science and research into policy, you've got to understand the chain of command. And I love what you said about that collaboration piece. But policy is quite blunt. 
it just gives us the headlines. So with biodiversity net gain, that's kind of front of mind for a lot of us at the moment in industry. It's becoming mandatory this November for development seeking planning permission. Mandatory biodiversity net gain in policy is a minimum of a 10% increase. And Natural England have published a biodiversity metric that will be the statutory instrument. And it's for a minimum 30 years. There's a little bit more, but that's it. It then comes to us in industry, and we're the ones who set good practice. We're the ones who set the benchmark, the quality that we work to. Uh, we've got our good practice guidelines for biodiversity net gain. So don't stop at policy. And absolutely, that collaborative approach. Just recognise that policy gives us the headlines, but you do need to go into the details of that. And my, my challenge in terms of how do we get um, usable and just echo what everyone's saying usable science into my world into my day to day to support my job to the research community keep up we are changing fast the question that I have today to ask all of you as researchers will change tomorrow and that is the challenge because we talk about in this agile project that we worked on that's been a year the questions that we had right at the start of last year are completely different to the challenges that I face today we have never seen such a rise of nature in industry it is fast track, it is fast changing. It's not just biodiversity net gain, there's a rise of nature-based solutions, there's a rise of TNFD that's being published in September. And it's really challenging because you need time to undertake the robust research that we need to get into policy. But I don't have time because my world changes so fast and decisions are made. A lot of that is the political landscape which has changed quite a bit recently. To give you an example, climate change. So biodiversity net gain, a minimum of 30 years, that will see changes in extreme weather events and it will see changes in climatic conditions. Now, the UK has some of the best climate projection data. So I can download it within a 12 kilometre grid <coughs> radius of the BNG. But what I don't have is the research, the data to know, well, OK, if there's one or two days of 40 degrees this year, but in five years time, that's 10 days of 40 degrees. Is that a threshold for woodland? You know, when is the, the extremes between droughts during the summer and flooding during the winter, when is that going to be a threshold that makes our habitats too vulnerable? So it's a great challenge and the key point to don't stop at policy, march straight into our world and industry and find a way to keep up. Fabulous. Problem formulation, usable science, data gaps, keep up. Um, I think we've got a pretty wide range there of some of the challenges faced by uh, decision makers in um, a variety, uh, an interesting variety of key organisations trying to actually put into practice uh, the translation of environmental science into policy making. So um, I'm going to pass over to you and first of all uh, invite you to raise any questions um, with individual panel members, anything you want clarified, uh, anything you want to hear a little bit more about before I'll then move on to a sort of third section, which will be um, you uh, answering that question yourselves um, so that we can hear your ideas on the, uh, the question of what are the key challenges um, to translating environmental science into policy in impactful ways. So first of all, an opportunity to uh, engage with the panellists on what they have said so far. Uh, yeah, it's absolutely fundamental. Um, Evidence-based policy, not policy-based evidence making is the sort of key to it, I guess. Um, and like I say, almost everything in my world is contested. All of these knowledges are partial, temporary, specific, uh, contextual, and challenged continually. Um, and quite often challenged for convenience, actually. Um, a lot of what we need to do is particularly unpalatable to certain sectors. Uh, as a society, more broadly as well, I used to work on, on food and um, the, the, I mean these are enormous questions about what we want from our environment, what we want from our land, what we want from 
uh, our practice in this space and that's why I think you know shared problem formulation is, is a huge part of how we get there um, trust you know trust is very hard won, very easily lost and I've done various public engagement exercises I, I live in North Devon actually so I tend not to tell people too loudly what my job is when I'm going for a cup of tea or something in the village um, I think listening is, is a huge part of that and that needs to be done professionally you know it needs to be done systematically and all too often uh, there are very partial very effective voices in this space that can make um, our understanding of what's trustworthy as, as information or not uh, very problematic so if you catch me in the tea break afterwards I'll give you a slightly more nuanced answer but uh, speaking personally as well rather than on behalf of the department how do I understand uh, what research outputs I trust and so on well you guys you know are in academia incredibly critical of each other and it's uh, a very effective way of ensuring that the rigor and scholarship is shining through it can be quite frustrating in the policy world that you're all arguing and bickering the whole time but one of the benefits of that is that nothing is left unchallenged uncontested in a way that that's helpful um, it can be very difficult to take that information and present it simplistically uh, and decisions quite often I think we've talked about blunt instruments and so on already on the panel policy is pretty blunt uh, it has to be tangible as well it's often time limited it's often coming off the back of a legacy of a whole bunch of other things uh, we're often solving the last problem rather than the current problem uh, farmers, farmers thinking who farmers are, what farmers want, how to reach farmers, how to impress upon farmers different practices or behaviours and so on. I think the farmers are in a very good position to tell us actually, not necessarily for us to tell the farmers. So I'm much more interested in shared problem formulation across a whole range of different practitioners, thinkers and so on. So um, I'm very happy to hear what farmers have to say about how to build trust and so on but also I think farmers need to play probably a stronger role in research as well um, they're not just custodians of the environment and, and all those sort of classic platitudes about you know who looks after our countryside produces our food and so on they're also very thoughtful people uh, and have very personal commitments to, to the land in my own personal experience and as I say I, I live in a, a farming community I see this firsthand on a, on a daily basis on the school run, etc. I got asked whether I would help out with sheep dipping the other day. I got home afterwards and was quizzed by my kids about wasn't that pollution and what would be the effects on you know uh, rivers and so on. And these are really really difficult questions. And then you've got livelihoods involved as well. So I think the stakes are very different for different people in terms of which way policy goes. And in Elms. I think that's one of the reasons why uh, there's so much contestation because the stakes are very high for people. You're talking about livelihoods, uh, you're talking about whether or not certain products and produce is what society wants and if you're talking about ruminants and cattle and so on, you're potentially also talking about what we think about meat and how meat works in terms of international trade, local trade, etc, etc. So I think these are massively difficult questions. So please continue to provide us the most high quality, robust uh, research that's been interrogated by all of your peers uh, that you can, um, because that's going to help us ensure that there's sufficient trust in the information, if not in all of the other practices that we need to pursue. It's been very fluid. I think it's really helped me appreciate you know the, the different pace of decision making perhaps in you know in the different you know compared to a government agency to consultancy to research you know government agency was long you know longer periods of you know taking time to to work I was working for the environment agency and the joint nature conservation committee in the UK 
on um, marine, marine monitoring. So it was very much about continual improvement of our monitoring program. So it was quite, you know, and that was, you know, when the Water Framework Directive was in. So it was, these are quite big, long-term policies that we were working towards. Um, so I think it's really helped me just understand how, um, you know, how different organisations approach problems. Um, and it, I think it just gives me a, a, a more well-rounded appreciation. I now work, you know, in um, particularly um, in environmental NGOs. There's a lot of people that have just worked in environmental NGOs for their whole career, and I do find some, you know, sometimes their way of thinking quite. It's just pretty typical environmental NGO, and um, I like to challenge that and go, well, you know, you know, I do see, I have seen things be done differently and you know is there is there a way that we could think about this in a slightly different way so i'm now in a strategic position in the wildlife trust which is great i get to actually set you know our strategic direction um and I, i'm in a position where i can kind of now challenge that and i can use all that experience of working up through the ranks of different sectors to um to be in that position to be able to influence that but i think it's it's helped me you know sometimes i think probably maybe you know even like five, ten years ago, I, I've been working for almost 20 years. Um, probably about halfway through, I may have thought, oh God, what am I doing? Like, what, I, am I just flitting from different sectors and is this a good idea? But I think now, on reflection, it, it has actually helped me get to the position that I'm in now. For me, personally, um, You've just mentioned like decision makers. There is there are there are decision makers everywhere. So I think it's about choosing. You know, you've got to hone. You know, choose a decision maker. Choose a a, a topic that you are you know, you're wanting to influence. And if you choose, you know, to work with a conservation NGO like the Wildlife Trust, then I will tell you what is useful for me as a decision maker. But it's not necessarily directly useful for Julia. That may be a slightly different question. So I think that to me is identifying and latching on to who is that decision maker um, and tailoring the research to them. That requires some um, critique from you as to whether it's worth working with the Wildlife Trust or should you be going for DEFRA? Um, but it is, you know, it's being aware that there are multiple decision makers and the usable science will be different for those different decision makers. The contributions on this? Just um, it's a really, really good question because that's it, isn't it? You know, we're all saying, can you give us some usable science, please? But if we don't tell you what that usable science is, I think from, from my perspective, you know, I have to stand up and, and justify, you know, to a client why they should be investing in this or to my company why they should be investing in this. And it kind of comes back to your question about trust, which is a really good question. Um, to give you a specific example, so we've looked into, you know, what's the research on the climate resilience of woodlands or grassland or heathland, whatever that is, and you get kind of anecdotal, you know, someone looked at a woodland in Devon and then someone, you know, had a little 25 metre square patch of grass in Cumbria and I just can't use that, you know, I just can't use the anecdotal one-off, you know, I need applicability, so I, I need the, 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 the studies which are great are the ones that swoop up all of the little anecdotal ones and say well this is the general trend and this is the big picture stuff and it comes back to my challenge which is can you keep up please because it takes time you know it's like the pennies in the jar you know to, to build up that but I personally look for the research that's actually built on other research you know or coming into that fact when it's not not just a one-off little patch of grass in Devon they've actually you know tried to scale it up and that might be UK or Europe or whatever that might be. Um, I, not, not much to add, I think it's sort of, Julian Pruitt sort of done a very good job of sort of explaining that, but I think sort of from my side is like, you know, we often need to talk to ministers about our policy and it's, and yes, we need usable science, but we also need science that we can also understand because, you know, we will be, I think, it, it, you know, you've got researchers who are the absolute experts in their fields. You've got kind of civil servants who, yeah, okay, they have a a reasonable knowledge of what they do and then you have ministers who just their portfolio is absolutely huge so it's kind of like it needs to get simpler and simpler that goes down the supply sort of part that goes down the chain and so i think having that usable science but also in a way which we can communicate very clearly as well um and you know i think um, as julia said you know the pace is so fast at the moment so you know if we are sort of 
you know, every hour is so precious at the moment because things are moving so fast. So, you know, if we're having to spend a lot of time trying to digest, right, what is it you've said? Oh, is this, is this usable? Then actually that makes it very difficult. And, you know, it is, it is quite time consuming. So it's kind of almost like it needs to be almost like presented in a way which it's kind of like this is usable because X, Y, Z, or it, it can be simplified in, in this way, or it, it's kind of almost helping us communicate that to other people as well. Because, you know, it, it doesn't just stop with, with us. You know, it's a lot of other people that we have to communicate this with um, as well. And just to quickly add on to that, that's really tough to do, yeah. really tough. <laughs> so this whole point about collaboration, you know, like ask us, how do you want us to present this research? You know, because it, the whole communication thing, I mean, I just, you know, I, it, I get challenged by it every day because I speak to so many different people. You know, you've got to constantly pivot from one meeting to the next, like change your tone, you know, whatever that might be. So don't feel you have to work alone on that communication piece. And that's the collaboration piece that you brilliantly mentioned. i say something as well. Um, <clears throat> so this whole space is opening up massively now, as uh, like you might not ever have seen before. Technology is playing a massive part in that, machine learning, AI, etc. But also, the I mean, our phones are just amazing things. And the amount of data that can be generated by people taking pictures of, of this, that, and all the rest of it. What it boils down to, though, is, you know, the sort of epistemology and ontology that we all have around uh, ensuring, you know, some of the basic tenets of scientific principles are applied, you know, triangulation and you know, looking for robustness, interpretability of information, its relevance, its timeliness, uh, validity. And I mean, obviously, we have all kinds of quality assurance, but we're often asked to uh, report to ministers on, on our confidence in the evidence. You know, what's the strength of, of uh, quality of, of the information being provided? And as I've always said, it's, it's very partial. And so the quality of the interpretation of data is hugely important and this is something the academy is really important in helping to drive new methods new qualities of assessment and so on in terms of what we do with the ever burgeoning amount of information available whether that's raw data whether that's clean data whether that's uh, data that can be shared not shared etc uh, and there are huge huge questions around um, you know data protection, data availability, intellectual property of all of that information as well, right? And academia needs to provide some leadership around that, working alongside uh, NGOs, civil society, etc. You know, we really need you because you know more about this stuff than anybody else, but you also need to be enabling uh, yeah. and helping to, to provide a platform for, you know, a democratization of all of this information too. And I think mm -hmm. its availability, its access is hugely important but the quality of the information's interpretation and its use thereof is something the Academy uh, could offer more leadership on, I think. I'm going to abuse my privilege of being chair hugely and just momentarily answer too, because I think um, uh, as a social scientist uh, who works particularly on the public engagement end, uh, who's spent some years, as Kira knows, um, uh, as usually the lone social scientist on a science advisory group, um, what I would observe is two things. One, um, uh, I remember learning early on uh, about a, a hierarchy of um, evidence that had been produced by one of the expert subcommittees of the Science Advisory Council at DEFRA, um, which at the top of this hierarchy of um, the kinds of knowledge that's usable um, was the sort of gold standard of the double blind medical trial. Um, and at the very bottom um, was a, an amorphous category uh, of knowledge um, labelled anecdotal. And that pretty much sort of included anything that we might think of, those of the social scientists in the audience, as qualitative. Um, uh, and of course, it also included most public engagement methodologies. So that was dispiriting, shall I say, uh, at the time. Um, and what did it spur me to do? So. I think picking up the point that, that Kieran made, there is a real challenge, I mean, across the piece for um, frontier scientists to turn their research into something usable. Um, 
but where the challenge I think is particularly strong is for social scientists who are in particular trying to um, improve the usability, to use that term, um, of uh, public engagement uh, methodologies uh, or indeed of qualitative data from different groups with stakes um, in these issues. And that is to produce for themselves and then for uh, policymakers, and probably with policymakers, um, really clear, bounded criteria as to what makes methodology X or Y that produces so-called qualitative uh, research input or public engagement methodologies, what makes it robust? Um, so that those criteria and techniques that set boundaries can travel and more people wanting to engage and use with those methodologies in the policy space um, can uh, adopt and reproduce them. And that would be immensely helpful um, on the basis of my experience in enabling um, decision makers to um, see that kind of knowledge as more reliable, more robust things that they can bring to their stakeholders of various kinds. Well, I mean, one of the huge problems with all of that as well is innovation, right? We are not set up to fail. We have to succeed, right? You will not be happy if we spend your money and things don't work. At the same time, we're being asked to be more inventive, uh, more inclusive, uh, more ambitious, etc. But all of that has, you know, inbuilt risks and, you know, inherent failure rates and so on. Um, and science is obviously all about failing and learning as well, right? I mean, this is the scientific method to, to some extent, right? So how do we, <clears throat> as a society, spend our money wisely so that we fail and learn and so on, and we accept, acknowledge, and absorb the knowledge that can be gained from these failings in order to produce more effective, more uh, inclusive, etc., more ambitious policies that, that work? And there's a, a tension that runs throughout that, right? So I have any number of pilots uh, in all of the schemes we run. We also have a program called Test and Trials, where we spend many millions of pounds each year looking at different techniques to see if they work, don't work, and try and contextualize them to different parts of the country, different types of, of uh, regime, et cetera. But ultimately, we still need to encourage an appetite to, to fail, to be inventive, to be innovative, to collaborate and so on. Potentially, if we could maybe share the burden of, of failure as well as success, then uh, we might get better at that. But welcome, other views. Um, I think sort of if you kind of look long term, I think ultimately you don't just have a, like, that's the goal. There's lots of in-betweens and there's lots of things that we can do in policy to kind of help that journey to reach that end goal. And I think sort of, especially sort of coming from a maritime perspective, you know, there's, there's a lot of things we need to do right now in order to sort of reach that end goal. But ultimately, that will affect businesses right now. You know, we have been told, well, if you do this policy, it is going to put us out of business. So what is it we can do to sort of help that transition? And I think this is where policy comes in really useful. And again, this is sort of where research is, is coming in useful. It's kind of like, well, how can we minimise that impact? And so one of the things that I'm doing at the moment is I'm looking at certain sectors in maritime which are kind of ready to go, they've got the technology, but actually which are going to be one most, um, I guess, effective in delivering carbon savings, but also at the minimised cost. And it's through research that is helping me actually to decide or help determine kind of what is the pathway to minimise the impact on those businesses. So I think whilst we, yes, we have that long-term goal, there's a lot that we can do to help minimise that, and that does come, that, that does come through research. Just really quickly, it's such a great question because it is, you know, it's that balance, isn't it? Thankfully, things are changing. In my world, biodiversity net gain, a minimum 30 years, and it might be longer depending on the habitat. And we're really looking at that now. But also my world is major infrastructure projects, design life over 100 years. So on, on those projects, you know, we've had to think really long term. You get a, 
a construction program that can be up for 10 years in a construction program. You know, so you constantly have like a, a look ahead, which is about three weeks, and then you have your larger program. So it's, I think it's about continually raising the need to, to okay, we need to really invest in long term, but also policy starting to catch up. You know, minimum 30 years for biodiversity net gain is, is good. And just briefly, I think there is a role for a particular type of science that is looking at that long term picture, you know, and, and trajectories, climate change in, in the environment, natural environment, climate change um, projections, but also what's needed um, for nature's re recovery internationally. So that type of research then gets, you know, taken up by big NGOs. And that's what we, you know, use to really push, even though we see governments doing whatever they're doing right now. We're always pushing, you know, with that research for that next, the bigger picture, which is really important, as well as, you know, answering those immediate and doing those immediate things. So it's interesting. So ever, uh, for those who maybe haven't heard of it, um, there is an international goal to, to protect 30% of, of, of land and sea. So that's about protected areas. But now there's another um, goal around restoration of nature as well. So that's come through internationally. Originally, it was all about protected areas. It's really interesting how this has evolved and it's kind of, it's morphed. Um, it's, um, you know, in the UK, it's been talked about more in terms of protection and our um, areas of outstanding natural beauty and national parks. And locally though, it's, we don't have, you know, we, we don't have that many protected areas locally. So what we want to do is see, we've, we've changed it, we've adapted it, because it's a high level target. It's, this is not necessarily scientifically robust anymore, but we've adapted it to a local context of we want to see 30% of land well managed for nature by 2030. Now that is very general and what that means and how you measure it is, is up for debate. But we see it as a really, it's, it's a high level target to just send us all in the right direction of let's try and do as much as we can now, you know, in the next seven years, it's not very long, um, to, you know, to see actual action take place on the ground. So um, there's quite a lot of, um, something that hasn't been necessarily mentioned that much is this, you know, adaptive management and learning and evaluation and how important that is, monitoring and evaluation to see whether what we do in, are doing is working or not. Um, so that's a really important part and that's a different sort of science. It's, it's simply you know, monitoring the effectiveness of interventions, which is super important um, and, and we really do need to see that across the board of conservation to make sure that we are, you know, we are being effective um, you know, to achieving something like that big international goal. I think one of the classic issues is that there's a knowledge deficit model. A number of academics who sort of say, have you read my paper? Have you seen my book? Because if you did, your policy would be different. The policy is not going to be different, you know, from reading your paper, reading your book. It's a much more complex and involved process than that. But if you could tell us what's in your book or in your paper, what it means for us, how it pertains to the policy, etc., that would be great. But that's not just your burden, that's ours as well. So we have to get better at these sorts of things. You know, this, I think one of the <clears throat> wonderful things about Agile and stuff is that we get the opportunity. It's very hard for me to take this sort of time out of my day, but it's really important, right? So um, thank you for having me. But there's something about physically having people from different, uh, institutions and so on physically sharing time and space right there's something about the parliamentary office of science and technology there's something about different forms of communication that potentially are, are less formalized uh, that really aid the the transfer of knowledge now there are any number of different initiatives to do this and they don't all work really but they're all trying and that's really important. So maybe the sort of sum is greater than the parts, but one of the, I mean, Sarah has been involved in this, but the Parliamentary Office of Science and Technology, or POST, they do post-it notes, so that's quite a cute little term and stuff. But what it does is make quite tangible, bite-sized bits of information, knowledge available, often on hugely complicated topics to policymakers. So 
I've worked on nanotechnology, genetic engineering, all kinds of really complicated stuff. Uh, and it would be great if we could have quite digestible formats for understanding what the latest thinking around all of that sort of stuff is. Um, but traditionally, academia doesn't make that easy, but we don't make it easy to try and listen either, right? So there's a bit of a, a job for us both to do to kind of uh, come back to this shared problem formulation that I mentioned before. Yeah, some of those summaries are incredible, you know, three sides mm. and you've got an entire, encompasses the entire 20 year field and whatever, whatever. Could I? Other, yes, please. Yeah. Go. Um, so I think, how can I say this? I think there is a long way to go for academic research institutions to, to be structured in a way to be open and useful to policy and practice. Yes. You know, we're we're getting there. There's research impact now that's that's really driving things, but you are still being driven to produce scientific papers, and that's not. You know, we've just said that's not that's not what we read. That's not. We're not waiting for for that. You know, piece of original research to take place. It is that more digestible form or a really targeted piece of research that answers a very specific question, which we don't really need necessarily the, the paper to come out. We just want the answers as soon as possible. So I think that there is a big role to play within universities to actually start to value that type of work that is really useful to policy and practice. And it's not just about counting the number of papers that you produce. Because it's still, you know, I, I worked as a knowledge exchange fellow here as a postdoc, um, but my career path within a university, not producing top notch scientific papers, but helping big businesses on biodiversity, was still not going to cut it a few years ago. So there's a lot to do to, to really change the way that research um, is valued in its different formats. Listen, can I thank our panellists who have been uniformly um, informative and really engaging and it's incredible that you've all taken time out of your very, very busy days and I'm grateful for your participation today. But can I also thank you guys? Excellent, excellent set of questions. I hope you have gained uh, something from this exchange and uh, thank you all very much indeed for your uh, contributions. Thank you.